All right. Uh, hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails Common Ground evening edition. Uh, this is kind of an experiment we're undertaking. So feel free to let us know how you feel about the PM, you know, taking our favorite show at lunchtime and moving to dinner time. Uh, I'm Malvika Jolly, the events assistant here at The Rail, and today I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC for a conversation on cultural analytics and AI aesthetics with leading digital cultural theorist Lev Manovich and writer, scholar, and all-around badass Mackenzie Warwick. We're also so lucky today to have the poet and writer and performer Stephen Ira here with us today, who will read to close today's program, so looking forward to that. We started all our events here with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in New York, we're on uh, Lenapa Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Asia, uh, Indian Nation. Uh, feel free to drop where you're tuning in from and we'll drop some relevant links. I feel like that's always fun. Um, the second is an acknowledgement that Black Lives Matter, and although we have for many events named many of those who have lost their lives to police violence just within the past year, uh, I would like to dedicate today's program to Breonna Taylor, who was murdered in her sleep by police just over a year ago on March 13th. Um, it feels relevant to perhaps tonight that she was murdered, un murdered under the modern day equivalent of the jump warrant, the no knock warrant. Uh, which allows the police to just sort of enter a place and do as they will. It's a holdover of a slave era uh, law. And as we found out in the years since, uh, what has happened to her was connected to the city of Louisville's multi-million dollar redevelopment and gentrification plan, functioning under the same extractive logics of white settler colonialism as warranted the first land acknowledgement. Uh, I encourage you all to check in the chat shortly where I'll be placing a living document of resources and actions uh, as we all do our part in the learning and unlearning required to undo these legacies of injustice. Uh, now it's my honor to hand the mic over to the fabulous Mackenzie Warwick. Uh, she's the author, among other things, of Reverse Cowgirl, which came out with Semiotext uh, just, I guess, two years ago, and Capital is Dead, which came out with Verso in 2019, uh, when she's not uh, frequenting Zoom uh, programs. She teaches at the new school, um, and I'll drop some fuller bios in the chat shortly. Mackenzie, handing it over to you. Thank you, Malfika. And uh, before I forget, my thanks to everybody at the rail team behind the scenes that uh, make these things possible. They usually run so so beautifully. Uh, it's a pleasure to be talking to uh, Lev Manovich, who I think we kind of met on nettime.org sometime in the 90s. This was, you know, social media, like 90s style, uh, where I was lucky to uh, read bits of what would become uh, Lev's first book, Language of New Media. Uh, I'm not going to do the bio now because I want to step through uh, some of the uh, sort of signal book-sized uh, uh, works that Lev's done uh, in the period since then. And the one that I wanted to uh, start with is a book that's called Software Takes Command, from uh, 2013. And Lev, I wanted to ask you about the idea of software studies and why someone who wants to understand 21st century culture would move to understanding software as a kind of analytic object. Well, first of all, I want to greet everybody. It's wonderful to see so many people, including various friends, uh, which makes me super stressful. Uh, so software studies. So first of all, I want to say that um, I think I first expressed this idea actually in the language of the media. So it's 1999, so it's 22 years ago. And this was a moment when you know, various people, including myself, thought that we should bring people attention to new subjects. And the idea of studies you know, looked good to me. So I said software studies, and then you know, other people started doing it. And then we actually had software studies event in 2008. Um, I first published my book completely online at the Creative Commons license in 2007. Um, and then I rewrote it and then it came out in 2013. Now I feel a bit embarrassed because in the last 10 years, I think we have like dozens of hundreds of new studies, right? So whenever people think about something, we have, let's have studies of this. 
So I like the word software. Word studies makes me a bit nervous. Uh, more directly, in response to your question, right? I mean, it's obvious today that technology right, plays a central role in our social, economic, but also cultural life. Networks, artificial intelligence, and machine learning, uh, you know, applications like you know, Photoshop or Zoom. Right? You know, our cultural, intellectual, social life is mediated by software. And then, you know, various people focused, right, on different parts of it. So there's, uh, you know, uh, there's lots of work about algorithms. Right? There's big data studies. Uh, there's internet studies. And I think this is all good objects. And in my case, you know, I picked up software as something which is maybe like umbrella term. But also because algorithms, you know, unless you're a programmer, right, you don't deal with them directly. But what we all deal with, right, is the software. I mean, Zoom, Photoshop, I mean, right, your phone, your favorite app, right, to make you younger or more beautiful or, you know, on your phone, beautify, et cetera, et cetera, you know, the web browser. So, so I like the concept of software because I think this is what most billions of people actually experience, right? And we also understand that. Facebook software, uh, TikTok software, and so on, right? It's not only an enabling platform, but it comes with certain affordances, so it enables things, but it also channels your creativity uh, in particular ways. Uh, there are particular things which are easy to do and not. So to better extent, software acts as a medium, the way cinema or books were, but it's also meta media because each of those platforms represents almost like its own media. So that's why software, because I'm kind of interested, you know, in what you know, what normal people do, I only write about things which I know. So that book had big chapters about Photoshop and After Effects, um, whereas algorithms, you know, and uh, platforms, it's a bit more abstract, right? It's actually something which is behind the scenes, but it's not on the surface. So the I'm, I'm glad you mentioned metamedia, because that was the other thing I wanted to get out of the, the work of that era. Could you say a bit about what you think defines uh, metamedia as a sort of specific turning point? Uh, oh, my God, this, <coughs> it's one of the most difficult things hmm. uh, you can ask me about. <laughs> so, um, so I think we all understand, right, that there are different artistic media uh, or communication media, you know, all the telemedia, you know, television, you know, used to be fax, telephone, and so on. Right? And then what I what are what I call representational expressive media, you know, paintings, drawings, you know, chalks and pencils and magic markers, and engravings and etchings, uh, and different kinds of photography and so on and so forth. So then what is the computer, right? Some people for decades were waiting for some genuine, authentic kind of computer expression saying when will computer become its own media, but it never comes. Mm. Uh, so in this book, I try to do something which is really hard and I'm not sure I succeeded, uh, which is to say, what type of media is computer? And if it's not a normal medium and what is, right? What is this strange thing? Because the strange thing can pretend to be paper. Right? Just last week, I got my new iPad and you know, just making notes, right? with uh, Apple Pen, I mean, it's pure magic. Mm -hmm. It can be paint, right? I mean, you go to, you know, again, painting applications with every kind of paintbrush you want to have. Uh, it can be television in a way like we have now. And so, I mean, right? so, so this guy can simulate all the existing media, but of course, add to them new functions. And also it allows us to define new media, right? So if you're a programmer, I mean, you can write some new protocol and you can have new communication thing, et cetera. So it both simulates existing ones, it allows for new ones. So I thought, how can we call it? And then I realized that there is a term which already was introduced by uh, probably a key person who actually developed this new concept of a computer and made it possible, which is Alan Kay, mm -hmm. uh, a computer scientist who's working with other people, including a psychologist at Xerox Park, Xerox Park in the you know early 1970s. And Xerox Park, you know, it's a kind of it's a kind of a Renaissance Florence for our era, right? This is where modern computing was defined. And he actually published an article where he did call computer metamedia. When he realized, okay, Lev, you don't have to invent anything. You just have to read the writings of people who invented modern computing. 
because it was very hard, right? So you, you couldn't just go experiment. You couldn't just start programming something processing like now, right? Uh, or on some Python collab code, you actually have to theorize it. And these people were kind of theorists. So this book is also attempt to reclaim engineers as theorists of new media. Uh, and Alan Kay in particular turned out to be a great person. So I just took the concept of, of metamedia from about 1970 and run with it. Hmm. The, uh, uh, I got so many other things I could, I, I could get into around that, but I don't want to get us stuck in, in uh, the work of that period. I wanted to move on to uh, like a slightly different, but related, maybe Metamedia, which is the phone and your work on yeah. Instagram. And, and I, I'm interested in the form that that work took. And then I'm also interested in the idea of uh, Instagram as kind of global uh, version of a kind of uh, cultural practice. And if you could pick up that that sort of uh, uh, strand of that work that you were doing then. Yeah. Instagram. You know, you, uh, one, thing, one thing I tell students is you have to kind of use your intuitions and make the right investments into the right research objects. Um, so in the late 2000s, right, I really wanted to write like a whole chapter on MySpace. I started to write this. I started to write this chapter for the software text command, and then I don't know. I just had this intuition. I should include it, and that was a good idea, right? And then in 2012, actually, was a brilliant PhD student, uh, Nadav Hochman, who came to me and said, "Lev, I want to work with you, and I want to work on Instagram." I'm like, "Okay, sure. If you're going to drive, let's do it." So you know, he used his laptop. You know, he collected. 2.6 million Instagram images uh, from 13 cities. At that time, Instagram API was still open. So it was kind of golden time for research. And then we you know, started publishing. And I think I'm proud to say it was the first kind of media or humanities theory you know, work on Instagram. And that was a good investment because when we started doing this research, Instagram had like 30, 30 million users and today it's over a billion. And, um, what I want to say about the global thing, you know, what, what is very interesting, right, about studying digital culture today is that, and again, you know, I'm talking about more like conceptually, like in reality, like I can't study Instagram today because we closed API 2016, but there is other things, right? There is, you know, there is, a, you know, there is a, a divine art and, uh, you know, and or TED or uh, Behance and all this. Uh, platforms have APIs, right? So we have mechanisms where you can go and collect information. I mean, whatever users put in, right? So you collect the same things which are visible. And what's mm -hmm. interesting about it is a, a global platform, right? Is that it, it doesn't take any more effort to look at the trends and patterns, what people create, their styles, their content across 100 cities or 100 countries as one country. And this is, I think, fundamental difference, right? So 30 years ago, you wanted to do research about, you know, digital art or analog art in different places. I mean, you had to get travel grant or whatever, and you had to go to those places. And that's why uh, so much of, uh, I think, cultural media theory was not so comparative. I mean, mm -hmm. think about Michel Foucault, who is brilliant and very productive, right? And why he's very productive? Because he's not very really comparative, right? He goes to French library and he sits there and studies something and then basically looks at the history of France, you know, medicine, linguistics, and so on. And then every three years, he publishes a book. Right, but today I can go to all these platforms and I can basically ask, you know, what are the differences between uh, digital art or the art sold uh, at NFT, NFT platforms between you know, Brooklyn and Queens, you know, and uh, uh, Moscow and Paris and so on and so on. So uh, we are really global platforms, uh, even though, of course, we know that not everybody participating. But, you know, I'm an optimist because I grew up in a communist country, right, in Soviet Union. So I find that lots of intellectuals in the West, we always try to find negative, you know, negative things in something. Oh my God, you know, the digital platforms, not everybody is represented. Yes. I think about how many people are very represented, right? And how much effort it will be to study anything comparatively 20, 30 years ago. So to that extent, you know, I'm an optimist. You'll never hear me say anything negative about the internet. And I think that makes me a bit radical today. <laughs> It's true, actually, that that is a kind of countervailing uh, style. But I get, could you unpack it a little bit more? How how you feel that relates to you know, if you're coming from the Soviet Union as it as it yeah. then was and no longer exists? And how you figure that as as your own sensibility? Yeah. Yeah. 
So I'm going to say something perhaps even more radical. I was thinking, you know, so Mackenzie is going to ask me always difficult questions. <laughs> the questions are so difficult. I lost my normal sense of humor because also it's also very early for me, it's eight o'clock. Mm -hmm. I try to arrange my life. So I never said how to have alarm. So about teaching after 1 p.m. So I think one way, so I said, what if he's going to ask you to define all my work in one sentence? Or you know, what, what if he will ask me to say, Lev, like how, how do you can you define where you know cultural analytics, which which we're going to get to pretty soon, right? So oh, yeah, that's that's coming. <laughs> okay. It's coming. Look at this, it's all a kid out in one sentence. So I think you can fit Lev is one of the few people in humanities who is writing non-Marxist accounts of contemporary culture. <laughs> right. Okay, um, and this is you got it, right? So the idea is that well, most people around today we haven't read Marx. But uh, there's this kind of Marxist air, so to speak, right? Which seems so natural. The companies are bad, artists are good, uh, we have to liberate people, uh, people are alienated, et cetera, et cetera. And I actually don't, I don't think any of these ideas are correct. I mean, I think Marx uh, was wrong on so many different accounts. Uh, I mean, you go today to you know, some workplace, well, people have better connections when they're having their families, you know, people have friends, right, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and there are places where people exploit it, alienated, and there are also tons of places where people have meaning from their work, right, and we feel very holistic about it. And the problem is that we just accept many Marxist ideas, we take them for granted, as opposed to uh, questioning them. So for me, uh, just to finish in my answer, one of the reasons, right, I'm this techno-optimist, so to speak, or global optimist is I think in the West, right? Including places like New York. I mean, we're so rich in resources. We can go to a library. You can go to university library, which you know probably gets you know every every journal you can get. Uh, there is magazines, there is great things like Brooklyn Rail. And then there are countries where all of contemporary art only exists on the internet, right? There are countries where all video art only exists on YouTube. Right, there are countries where contemporary poetry only exists on Twitter. I mean, there are countries like Russia, where uh, pretty much right, all the intellectual life happens communicated through Facebook, right? Um, and uh, that's a perspective I adopt, right? So even though I live in the West, I think of myself as a kind of spy coming from the so-called, I don't know if I call it developing world, but we can call the world which is less rich in resources. Uh, and uh, the change which the internet has made in the, de in the development of these countries and kind of keeping the modern culture alive is just so, so important. And uh, I think we have to be very global and we have to think about people who are less fortunate than we are. Um, so maybe if you're in America, people get obsessed with internet, with Facebook is going to collect your data and show you your ads. You know, and people in other countries, we have more essential needs. So the fact that they can communicate for Facebook, or the fact that tens of millions of people can like sell something online, right? Or set up or yoga classes and actually can make living from Facebook. Well, that's to me already justifies social media and mm -hmm. uh, makes it it makes it more important and makes me to forget all its supposed sins. Yeah, I, I, I always love this about your work uh, because it is outside the, the sort of standard uh, uh, emotional repertoire of, of Western intellectuals. I also love it. I'm a, I'm a card carrying Western Marxist and I kind of love this stuff because to me, one of the things you're always writing about is the, the means of production, like how are digital things actually made in some detail rather than just sort of hand waving about it. And I always really appreciated that quality. But then I, I wanted to segue through that to uh, the, the next sort of chunk of your work to do with AI aesthetics. And then what happens when the machine is actually making the artifacts rather than as with when you're looking at uh, software, the, the software is an array of tools through which the human makes the artifact. So um, I think most people, right, probably know when you and me mention AI art, AI generative mm -hmm. art, but maybe not everybody. So um, what I would like to do is just literally for about 15 seconds, share the screen and just show you the latest examples, uh, which I think is you know very, very interesting. So let me just do it for a second. Here we are. And uh, we're going to go to here. Yeah, so, you know, I've been reading all these wonderful computer science papers about style gain, style gain two and so on. 
In effect, I'm now very actively involved in uh, learning how to do it myself. Uh, so I promised to learn, you know, to program, you know, Python and Colab notebooks, etc. you know, by the end of the year. And also thinking about writing very seriously about digital art, the way I would write about, so the way about AI art, the way I would write about normal art, right? So maybe I want to be the first person to develop this new idea or new field of AI, crit AI art criticism, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I realized last night with, you know, this um, computer scientists, so sometimes we're really young people, students, we often post like renew experiments on Twitter. <laughs> so Twitter is a great source. So this is somebody. And uh, this was right, AI generated art, which to me is kind of remarkable because even maybe last year, it was very easy for me to pick up that something was AI generated because not everybody knows, but I was trained as an artist, as a painter since the age of 13. And I can make my living uh, doing media theory just because I like to hang out with academics and I don't like to hang out with your know, collectors and curators, <laughs> uh, just my thing. You know, and I think, so basically I've been looking at art and making art and teaching art all my life, right? And I look at this, it's actually impossible for me, right? To pick up the this way I generate it. Um, and uh, just to show maybe one more example, right? So he has here, he has something like this here, right? So here maybe you can tell there's this very strange distortion of a face. So sometimes it happens um, when you get things like this, right? Look at this, look at this, right? Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> so way, right, the way this is done is uh, you would take, we, we take a big collection of existing artworks. Typically we use the source called WikiArt, which is what everybody in computer science uh, and in this field now uses. And people maybe don't know WikiArt is created by a couple of people from Ukraine, from Kiev. So many Russians are in this field, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and then you kind of feed the network with images and there are two networks, right? This is why it's called GAN. So one network is trying to kind of create similar images and the second network is judging it. It's saying, yeah, this is more similar or not. And the idea is to create images which are very similar to existing art, but not the same. Yeah? And uh, it's amazing, we started in 2015. So it's amazing the progress we've seen in five years. And uh, I said, I'm good to write about it. Maybe I'll be the first person to write a book, <laughs> not about the language of the media, but about the language of your art, we'll see. But what I want to say is this, right? I think this shows you how quickly AI can eat art, cinema, architecture, and so on. Right? If this is the level of achievement we got in five years, imagine what we'll see in the next five or 15 years. And uh, I want to say something maybe even more radical. It's going to be even more radical in my statement, you know, with I love Facebook. Um, this makes me wonder about the future of media. I mean, we're talking about the past, Alan Kay, but I want to say a few things about the future. So now I'm developing a new project. It's not a book yet, uh, but it will be how to predict culture and art in 2050. And I say we predict not just hypothetically, but actually try to generate some quantitative predictions. So I've been teaching this class in Moscow, now I'm teaching in Tel Aviv. And one of the things, of course, I would like to predict what kind of media we're going to use in 20, 30 years. And I'm beginning to wonder if it's still image, a painting, a photograph, right? Or this strange new thing AI generated, right? Are we going to be still important in about 25 to 30 years? Because I think you also have AI, right? Which is now used in photography, right? I mean, you get luminar AI, you put any picture of any shit and it comes out masterpiece and after that, you don't want to make photography anymore because it becomes meaningless. So what I wonder is that within the next 15, 20 years, right? Today you take a picture, you compose it, and then you know, you, your software or Google Photos make it perfect, you know, and very soon your camera or your device will be also composing pictures. This is the last, the last thing which is left for human photographers. So I think in the next 15, 20, 30 years, AI will make, can make all the images so perfect. So ideologically precise in every messaging, right? And very connotational notations. But it will be basically impossible for professional photographers, video makers, visual designers to compete with everybody else and that's why 
perhaps the image will become less important and maybe what will become more important when next 20 to 30 to 40 years is a new kind of three-dimensional representation, right? I mean, of course, not VR, not AR. This is idiotic technology, which will never work, but a kind of holographic, right, three-dimensional thing. Basically, what we've seen in all the sci-fi movies, right, people stand around the table with some interface, right? You know, we're playing something, some bottle or with some figure talking to you. And this will be so new that you wouldn't be able to do it with your little camera, uh, because also I think what's important in thinking about how visual communication or any media evolves, professionals want to distinguish themselves from amateurs. We have to compete. So that's why professionals always have to invent new and more complex media. Like the web was so simple, right? In 97, everybody can write the IBM page or Microsoft page was not any more complicated than the page put out by 15 year old. And now like you have to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for a website. So once generating this perfect, you know, bizarre, Vogue, uh, wallpaper, quality images uh, becomes available to everybody, VI, perhaps media will move to something else. So, sorry, this was maybe lots of different things joined, but- I love it, yeah. It. You, you I, say, like, yeah. That's, that's what I think about now. Like basically you just like, I'm just like taking things out of my theoretical unconscious. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I'm just thinking of um, uh, before the pandemic, I went back to rave culture. I wanted to like, you know, just like dance like an idiot with like a hundred other people in a, you know, abandoned warehouse in the middle of nowhere to a DJ. But at what point do you automate the DJ as well? Uh, and, and that function is no longer necessary, uh, I wonder. But I, I wanted to segue from uh, uh, the kind of um, uh, automation of the production of the image to the, uh, role of the computer as tool for the critic, and maybe if that's a way of thinking about mm -hmm. this project, uh, to what to what extent can you sort of use the computer to process, you know, sort of massive amounts of data about an aesthetic phenomena? And is that one way of describing maybe where cultural analytics was going for you? Thank you so much. Great. Um, so I think to me, probably the most important dimension in uh, kind of contemporary culture evolution is scale. Yeah. So in 1984, I joined the company called Digital Effects. It was in New York, around 44th Street and 7th Avenue. And I become one of 40 people in the world who is using computer to make 3D computer animation. And I joined the company, we recently finished making titles for Tron, not the remake, the original one. So it's like 50 people in my community, right? It was avant-garde people. In 97, some of us travel to Germany to the ZKM right? and uh, go to this beautiful hall and gather at the opening of a premier European and actually still the most important digital museum and center for digital art. And there's a few hundred people there. And that's pretty much probably all professional digital artists. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy at the time, right? To be kind of a critic and theorist, you just go to Arts Electronic or Isaiah or Seagraph and you see like a few amazing works and you write about it. It's so easy. I was so late. And then one day I woke up in 2002, 2003, and suddenly I realized there were millions of people doing it, partly because computers became faster uh, and had more memory, partly because artists invented new, uh, very easy to use uh, programming languages for artists like processing. Mm -hmm. I actually started using processing just a few weeks ago. It's amazing, but still a bit too hard. You know, mm -hmm. And I'm like, Lev, what are you going to do? I mean, you have to be, be honest. Uh, you have to uh, pay, you have to be honest to your times, right? Because you are, remember, I grew up in Soviet Union, which was a country of hypocrisy. Of course, America is also a country of hypocrisy, but in a different way, right? So for me, it's very important to kind of be this honest, play the honest role, honest theory. And honest theory is something which has to account for where culture is going. So if culture suddenly expands from, you know, let's say, a few million people doing it, to 3.5 billion today, how do you stay honest, right? How do you pay attention to it? How do you write not just about something which is exhibited in pace and gagosian, mm -hmm. but about creativity of you know, millions of people? So in 2005, I said, maybe we can use computers as the tools to help us see, observe, and think about this new expanding digital culture. And I think another way to put it is to say, in the 20th century, you know, the number of professional cultural artifacts being produced here you know, was not so big. 
So people write about this film called classical Hollywood cinema, right? The kind of language of cinema in the 40s and 50s. And you, know, you could basically go watch these few hundred films which we made, or you can talk about Renaissance. So how, again, so how do you become, how do you kind of criticize digital art or photography when you have like one million photographers on Instagram? Um, so we can say for, until recently, the challenge for a theorist was how do I understand the effects the structure, the meanings, you know, the, the grammar of the image, a movie, video game. And now the challenge is how do you look at even 1% of them, right? So that's why I started with cultural analytics business. Uh, I was very lucky. I was a professor of visual arts, actually, right, of digital arts in the visual art department at the University of California, San Diego, right? One of the top US science universities. I was invited to work in the new research institute. Uh, they actually gave me like a space for a free lab. Uh, and resources, and I was joined by a few brilliant young people. And the next four years, we made 45 projects where we tried to apply computer tools to look at all kinds of visual media, uh, comic books and manga and magazine covers and paintings, uh, and basically be able to say, okay, there's 1 million pages, right, from manga books. So can the computer find out what is the kind of stylistic universe, right, in this manga? Do the books uh, created for women audience, you know, have a kind of different style than books created for, for a male audience? Uh, or if we take like all the paintings created by very canonical artists like Vincent Van Gogh, where historians tells us that most artists have experience in their life. So Van Gogh paints one kind of painting when he's in Paris, when he goes to art and his style changes. But when we took all his paintings, right, and extracted your know, colors and texture, etc., and can visualize how we change, we got a completely continuous curve. Mm -hmm. Right. So to me, that was very important. Uh, I realized that when we use computer tools, we allow us to notice different dimensions, right, in uh, visual art, cinema, you know, architecture, and so on. Uh, and in a way, we make it very easy to think of development of artists to whole historical periods in terms of continuity, right? Uh, so you realize that Van Gogh goes, and I'm talking about Van Gogh because I don't have to show his images. I think everybody knows, right? When Van Gogh goes from Paris to R, he still produces lots of Parisian paintings. He still produces lots of paintings which are very really dark and he has the earlier style. So the style of an artist doesn't change dramatically when he goes from place to place. It's not a river, right? Which only can change the course very, very gradually. Uh, so to me, you know, that was very interesting and uh, just, just finishing up. Uh, so of course I was not the only one to think about it. Although probably our lab was the first one to start applying computer vision and machine learning to art, you know, to art images. Uh, but we also have our fields, which are very big now, digital humanities and people use other terms, the uh, culture genomics, uh, cultural informatics, computational humanities. And also we have, you know, digital art history and so on. So this is all developing. And uh, I think it's a good thing. Um, I don't know if the use of computer tools is enough to make humanities hot again. Hmm. I'm sure as me, uh, you and probably some people in the room are also worried about the diminishing place of humanities, at least in the US. I, I'm, right? I'm not actually, that's are not you not, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm also not, I'm not because I'm a professor of computer science. I also don't care. I mean, I care, of course, deeply. Um, but I'm just thinking, you know, if, if people like in the 60s, you know, Julia Christieva and uh, Roman Jacobson and Levi Strauss, if we had computers, oh my God, these people do amazing things. Like, I'm not sure we live in the most uh, intellectually interesting period in humanities. I think humanities have this amazing intellectual renaissance from uh, late 40s to maybe late 80s. And people invented so many new things. And in fact, uh, it turns out, I just found out the other day, it turns out to people like Levi Strauss, who want to get computers mm -hmm. because we wanted to describe the diversity of cultures. Mm -hmm. Levi Strauss didn't want to reduce culture to binary oppositions. He said, I have to do it because, because IBM didn't give me computers. Of course, okay, I'm a bit exaggerating, but the point is like actually with European thinkers wanted to get computers, but they couldn't get any, IBM wouldn't give them. If IBM would give them computers, perhaps the whole history of intellectual ideas would be different. Uh, so there's always super interesting connections, uh, you know, we can uncover about, in fact, people thinking, dreaming about using computers in the early decades of 20th century. 
So it's, it's also very interesting. It's, it gives us a different way to look at this history. Yeah, there's, there's actually more connections between uh, the birth of information science and the humanities than people even know about. The Macy Foundation conferences are, are famous. Uh, turns out um, uh, Lacan probably got purloined letter out of some stuff that was being discussed at Macy around yeah. computer science as well. Uh, and we sort of lose a lot of those, those connections, I think. Yeah, I think, I think <laughs> once, once, once this theory has been imported into Anglo-Saxon context and other contexts, I hope for some reason, many of the things were lost. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure why, right? Yeah, but that's it. different conversations. Well, well, because, we, because we tell the story of the humanities as if it's always building out of itself rather than drawing from other media. Uh, and in this case, the meta media of, of computers, like we sort of need a different history of it. And there, there are some scholars who've done some, uh, some bits of that. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you the, the, about the sort of the, the thing that's sort of, you know, the discourse is all about at the moment, which is is NFTs. That if you want to sort of sure. put your your take on that one, be, to preempt the yes. question, if you like. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So you know, for for for, me, for many months or years, I was resisting the mm. whole kind of blockchain thing. Uh, I do realize that intellectual is very important. Like you know, just as open source, when open source first appeared, there was a concept with computer science, and later became very very important. But uh, now with the cultural analytics book is done, I can play with processing. You know, I'm using GarageBand to make music. I mean, uh, oh, so awesome. I, I, want, I want to see you on SoundCloud sometime. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's coming, yeah, etc. And also, like, I'm, uh, I actually got approached by New York Gallery. They asked me if we want, we can, if we want, if, we, if I would allow them to sell my early digital works and NFTs. I said, of course, great. Uh, anyway, but uh, let's, for most people who don't know, right, so this is a rather recent phenomena. Uh, suddenly, digital art becomes a vehicle for speculation. But the thing about NFTs, it's very hard, right? There's many positive things about it, and there are very negative things about it. The positive thing is that all the transactions are open, right? So it's uh, basically buy, exchange, sell anything, including digital art online. Uh, using blockchain technology, so every transaction is recorded. And supposedly, right, every time that you buy something, when somebody beats and kind of buys it for more, but you know, the image file, like, I mean, the objects never have to be shipped because it's all digital, right? So it's like this mega capitalism. And the liquidity of digital art turned out, right, to make it perfect uh, as a transaction vehicle. But what's nice about it, first of all, transactions are open. So much of kind of culture manipulation happens behind the closed doors. And also, you know, every time somebody buys or sells it, I mean, the artist, I think, gets 10%. So that's an amazing model. And in fact, uh, I think it's an example of how the models which actually exist in the culture industry, every time, right, like your song is used, you get paid, uh, right? I mean, film comes out, you know, everybody gets credits. It's much better than the art world models, where like, right, artist assistants make work, but you never know about it. There are museums, right, who want to make an exhibition of famous artists. An artist says, okay, I don't have time to do it. Here's the kind of work I want, go and curators do it. I mean, people tell me about it. So there's some of the great things about NFTs. And then, of course, there's aesthetics of them. For those of us who spend our careers in digital arts, uh, probably rolling their eyes. Uh, so let me show you, like, just examples of one of these platforms. Here we go. Okay, not this one. Uh, okay, here we go, right? So this is foundation. Um, so here's the platforms. So you can see like this is the works uh, for which bidding is now open. Okay. Uh, so ETH is one of the digital currencies. Uh, and then this is works which we not sold. Okay. Right. And this is sold, right? And uh, I think we should just like have a moment of silence and just look at them. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's uh, kind of fascinating, right? It's like a digital unconscious. Uh, it's also kind of work you would see on uh, deviant art and so on, right? Uh, so suddenly this, what some people would call vulgar, banal, out, right? outrageous, uh, bizarre world of popular culture is entering the world of server bees, right? auctions and high culture. Um, and it's sort of terrifying, but it's also amazing. 
So lots of it is a 3D computer animation, as you can see, right? So I actually don't know why we think it has to be digital. Why can't you just scan a drawing and also sell it? Uh, uh, right? People are selling their first tweets. And um, I only started looking at this literally a few days ago. So, but of course, there's so much of digital art. Maybe I can do cultural analytics on if it is art and find out like, what are the different styles and maybe we can even predict like, you know, what, what will get is, sold. Is there, uh, it's sort of fascinating. Is there where you could extract information to do work on it? Well, so yeah, so for example, here's the work, right? So here's what's nice is that it's all right, very detailed. So here's mm -hmm. somebody like, placed a work in auction. So you get this record, right? You mm -hmm. get this record, right? This is the stamp. Uh, like I think what happened three days ago. And then every time, right, somebody kind of, uh, kind of right, puts a bigger price in this auction, you get the same record. So I think this price by itself is, kind of, this part is fascinating, right? Um, and very much far reaching. And, um, you know, we'll see where it goes, right? Um, I think that like many other digital phenomena, it will get transformed. And hopefully the good things about it, we've heard artists now can be get paid for every transaction will remain. Uh, but there's also, it's also example, I think how we live in the moment. Like I feel all the culture in which I grew up, right? Up until about 2015, we live in this new strange world where all the rules are off. Like Prince Harry, right, leaves, you know, leaves London and now goes to California and becomes executive in UK company, right? Uh, with people who are making this little digital things on their computer suddenly in the center of art world, right? Like I feel probably, that's probably how people felt in Russia in 1980. <laughs> suddenly <laughs> in this new world and all the meanings, right? All the, all the ideological structures, all the values you have suddenly don't make sense. I'm just yeah. hoping that it's not going to have, I'm hoping I'm not going to live forever uh, <laughs> because I actually like my old world. You know, I like my world, which had rules. You <laughs> know, I'm an avant-garde creature, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but at the same time, I'm compelled uh, why why I have to write about this stuff? Why can't I write about Giorgio Morandi, right? Or Matisse, you know, or uh, Pasternak, you know, but somehow I have to because somebody has. Anyway, I'll stop sharing. No, I I, I love I love this. And and my, my first thought is, you know, this is like way more uh transparent and even regulated than the actual art world is you know like you you cannot in real estate or the car business you know represent the buyer and the seller of the same transaction but in the art world you can you know like there's no transparency about prices and and let's face it a lot of the art in the, the art market's not great anyway so it's kind of like this this actually doesn't look worse to me uh although one might note the amount no, of i would say i would say if you're basically right so we used to live for about five years in chelsea we actually live in 23rd street Second so exit our building, and here's a paste gallery. And I will tell you that you know, so there's about 350 galleries in Chelsea. And if you mm -hmm. go to the five or ten famous ones, about 40% of the time you see great art. As far as the rest of them, yeah, this is not worse or better. Yeah. Uh, which is also an interesting phenomena, right? But today we have this explosion of this kind of art, mm -hmm. which is okay. It's not good, it's not bad. It's just pictures. <laughs> It's pictures, you know, and, and, uh, which and, is what which is what art is for most people, right? For most people, art is like a picture. Okay, anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Like my other thought was, uh, I actually like that that analogy to the the shock of Soviet Union collapsing, and you're sort of confronted by a new mode of production that the sort of bulldozes the failed one out of the way. But is, I, you may know, I, I sometimes argue this is not even capitalism anymore. Maybe it's something weirder, and I, I wonder to what extent. Uh, we can we can see uh, uh, use, use the antennae of art to sort of detect what changes might be passing through the entire kind of uh, economic and cultural sphere at the same time. Well, I would say that so one thing about capitalism, you know, um, so one thing I do, like I have its methods, which I use in my work, right, which I can actually teach people, right, I can do this like a video course. So one method is you take every you take any concept people love, you say maybe it doesn't work. So I love to see people with, I don't think there's a capitalism ever existed. Mm. I will, okay. Like, what do I mean by this? Yes, of course, what I was capitalism means of production. But I kind of think that the idea of capitalism, right, we can Marxist analysis, it disregards cultural, national, geographic, right, all kinds of differences. And basically, it says that economy is what's important. 
And this means of production is what really matters, right? So it's very structuralist. But, you know, as I travel around the world, right? And I have to travel because the only way I can see a world, you can't see a world for data. So in 2019, I had a sabbatical. Typically when you take sabbatical, you go to some university, you talk to some scholars. I said, I said, you know, fuck it. Uh, I can talk to scholars on Zoom, you know, and all so many friends are here. I'm going to the civil world. So me and my wife, you know, packed our bag, kind of give up our Chelsea apartment, put things in storage, we're still in storage. And we spend time in 27 cities in 18 countries. And while I think capitalism, modernism, modernity, super modernity exist, we get so much modified, right? Uh, by local conditions, by local mm -hmm. cultures, but perhaps these differences are more important, right? Than uh, similarities. Uh, and again, right, like I'm not against words like capitalism or globalization, but we try to take this diversity of social cultural phenomena, right? And, and reduce it to a single concept. And that made sense in the 1840s because Marx didn't have computers. <laughs> and Levi Strauss couldn't get his computer from IBM, right? But today yeah. you can get your laptop and you can potentially represent the whole of humanity in great detail, right? So for example, you can put, you know, bio every artist, all the artworks, uh, you can potentially follow billions of people, their activities. And I think we need to develop a new kind of theory, which I would call more middle level theory, right? Something which doesn't use these terms like capitalism, you know, East, West, South, uh, art design, but something which is more closer to the ground, something which is more kind of bottom up, which is what cultural analytics, right, exactly was trying to do, right? Develop a new way to look at art and culture from the features of artworks and uh, do not start from existing categories. Mm. Um, I mean, again, it's a very big claim, right? But what I'm saying is that the Enlightenment and modernity generated an amazing conceptual software for us to understand the world. But people didn't have the tools to study, to follow, to track, to analyze the kind of everydayness, the life of billions of people or you know, millions of people at the time, you know, the companies, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe I'm going back in a certain sense to 19th century physics, right? <laughs> Uh, which started to, you know, go inside the matter, right? So Newton deals with like whole objects and the physics go inside the ground molecules and atoms and neutrinos. Like I imagine like a new kind of art history without names where it has no, no categories, no periods, no schools, even no artists where every single object is a part of artwork, a few inches of a canvas. And that's the level on which we can operate. And we can, because the computer makes it now possible, right? So the point is with the computer, I think is amazingly revolutional Mm. Uh, epistemological tool and how can we like take advantage of it to think differently right and that's of course you know was a conclusion of my book which is called provocatively again how to think about categories so you know i i totally respect and i myself use the term capitalism but at the same time i can want to question it just because it's so broad you know? yeah the the thing i want to ask then is would be about the tension between uh local conditions and their modifying capacity and the the nature of something like instagram as a global platform that has pretty much the same features wherever you use it anywhere in the world so what's that how do you think about the tension between those two things oh God, you know i feel like i'm like i feel like you know uh uh like i'm a soldier right in the kind of open field in the right cannon and like the moment I deflect one cannon, you just put out a new one. No, it's great, it's great, but like I feel I don't need to make my I don't need to work out today. This is gonna be my like mental physical workout. Um so you're absolutely right, right? And one thing we noticed uh, in the 2000s and so maybe even 90s that these tools have a certain universal dimension. Mm. You know, you get Photoshop and it kind of looks the same wherever you are in Harbin, China, you know, or dozen. Korea, you know, or uh, to men, Russia, and so on and so forth. So in a way, we can say that the software is the first Esperanto, right? It's the first universal language. And I'm thinking about how people in the beginning of the 20th century, right, we're thinking about, you know, visual culture and abstract art and cinema as a kind of universal language because you had all these immigrants moving to the cities, including like America, 
and people very much thought of silent cinema as the new universal language. You know, we do have this universal language of software, even though the commands can be customized, but it is the same language. Um, and I think this brings us to perhaps the most difficult question, right? Does the software, AI, recommendation systems, uh, globalization, uh, travel, uh, global education, do all these different forces lead to concert monoculture, right? Uh, to a decrease in cultural diversity, or I mean, why not look at the opposite idea or maybe we increase cultural diversity, right? And uh, I would love to do something crazy. I would love to be actually be able to measure it uh, in order to have a more intelligent conversation. And I'll just mention a couple of things. It's of course very hard to study. It's impossible to study. And that's why I want to do it, right? I only want to work on impossible things because if you give yourself a impossible goal, you'll never get to here, but you can get up to here. If you give yourself like a more modest goals like most people do, you get up to here. So it makes sense to put impossible goal. So impossible goal is how do you measure it? How do you study diversity of culture worldwide? Of course, depends on your definition. But one thing I want to say, so for example, was a study of uh, quantitative study of uh, YouTube like 10 years ago. And we basically found out that YouTube recommendation engine, it does expose people to more diverse content, uh, which is maybe not counterintuitive, but you know, but it changes every day. Like every day algorithm changes. So today it can show you more things, tomorrow it can show you less things. So it's very hard to theorize about it. And then Spotify released uh, their own study. Of course, we don't know the contrast them. Uh, I think last year we said, you know, we look at a bunch of Spotify users, like, like how many millions, and they found out on, on the average, the average Spotify user has been listening to more and more different artists and genres over the course of uh, two years. So we claim that Spotify increases cultural diversity, which of course Spotify would want to say it, but there is no way for us right, to track it because the data is closed. Mm. So these companies are sitting on the basically cultural data. Um, so of course, if you want to be culture fairies today, you probably have to get AI, uh, PhD in AI and go work for Spotify, but then you'll never have time to write your cultural theory. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, so that's, these are all, I think, very interesting questions. Yeah, does this, does this new recite of interfaces and mm -hmm. access leads to kind of, right, with certain monoculture, or maybe it does increase cultural diversity. And uh, maybe we can like take all these artworks from NFT auctions and look at them. And, you know, it's a very interesting question to me, at least. It wouldn't be great to, to actually study these things empirically, but, but as you point out, the, the data that you would want is proprietary and uh, getting uh, uh, Spotify or Facebook or whoever to give it up is a whole other question. Uh, Malvika, I wanted to ask, uh, it's probably about time to head to questions since we're more or less on the hour. How do you want to handle it? Um, we have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, do you feel ready to, to move on? Yeah, yeah. Do you want to, you want to ask them? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, thank you both so much. This has been a really enlightening talk. Um, our first question comes in from Eric Flores, who is in the chat, but had to step away momentarily for a call. Um, and the question is, uh, NFTs, uh, digital art tokens are a huge trend right now. How can they impact the collective art investment market in terms of social networking? Can you sort of lay a landscape for us? Sure. Um, yeah, so I have nothing original to say about it. There are millions of videos, articles by very smart people. I only started looking at this literally a few weeks ago. Um, so, but again, there are lots of resources. And uh, sorry, I only, you know, I kind of like to think about things for a few years before I have an opinion. So I'm not ready yet. <laughs> Mackenzie, how about you? I, I, I feel like I'm yeah, so I'm gonna curious. Pass on that one. You're going to pass on that one. Ignorance. Yeah, it's a good question. I'm just not not a person who can answer that one. I feel like I'm I'm wandering, looking for someone to like sit me down and explain explain this to me as well. So uh, I'll wait on that. Um, our next question comes from Hovi Rock, and uh, Hovi, you should be able to turn on your microphone now. Hello. Hi. 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 Um, yeah, sorry. Um, so my question was, um, if and when they develop uh, artificial general intelligence, which seems likely, um, given the power of artificial general intelligence to be self bootstrapping, uh, could this possibly develop simulations of such depth and detail that they would create a new kind of art form? 
Mm-hmm. Well, I thought we were going to ask your question, which was wonderful, uh, which you put in the chat, but this is also very good. But just uh, very briefly to address your other question, is left discussing kind of theory based on data mining. If theory that rejects grand architectures in favor of emergent categories, the big data generates, yes. Uh, I'm not sure the word emergent is the one I like to use because maybe it's also reused, but a kind of like a middle level theory, so to speak, right? So, and I'll just want to say one thing, I will address you our question. So think about our understanding of 20th century art. I mean, you go to MoMA, right, or our museum, and uh, first it's all very clear because there are always isms which artists themselves define, cubism, fibism, surrealism, installation art. So when artists themselves created the category, it's very easy, right, to understand. And then you have this world, which is actually not in museums, not in MoMA, which is 99.99% of all art people done in the last 120 years, which is realism. And we don't have a single term for it, which is called figurative art, which means we completely fail to account for it, right? So, um, so how do you account for it? Well, you know, we can basically, we don't have any categories. And I think one way to generate these categories, of course, we can look at artist training backgrounds, but we can also look at millions of artworks and, and perhaps use computational tools to derive various categories, so to derive different clusters, right? So I'm trying to say that while the categories are important, we only account for like 1% of cultural production at best, uh, and the rest is just this great unknown. So why do, why do the real art of 30th century not in museums? Because artists didn't create categories for it, right? So somebody has to do it. Now to a question about general artificial intelligence. So recently I read some articles which actually say, like I was kind of surprised because I also like this concept, but perhaps it's a bit of a wrong idea uh, because also it's not clear what it is. They uh, uh, will have general artificial intelligence in our lifetime. I'm not at all sure, it's not as obvious to me. Uh, and for those who don't know, right? So today we don't have artificial intelligence. What we have is the computer scientists who got better at solving different particular tasks. So the same thing, there's no computer vision, right? Computers can see. Computers can detect objects in the scene. Computers can detect faces, right? Uh, they can detect even uh, presence of uh, photo techniques. You can say this photo has a close up. But it's not the same thing as seeing, right? So there is a computer vision, there is automatic translation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But these are all particular tasks, right? There is no intelligence there. Um, so, so I think the second part of your question was, right? So let's say the computers become more advanced, general artificial intelligence or something else. Can we generate new kind of art? We are already generating new kind of art. And that's what I realized in the last month, right? I'm working with some students here in South Korea and uh, we're kind of doing some experiments. Okay, but don't tell everybody because these experiments, people are not supposed to know. So basically what we do is we use the latest like gun model uh, same people I showed you on Twitter, and we generate thousands of these AI images. And the network was fed like 100,000 images from 70 artists. So it basically has this amazing un- cultural unconscious, right? We now transfer our cultures to network, and we can have this unconscious and we generate this kind of new artifacts. And many of them are amazing. And uh, we look like the kind of art you have seen. You say, oh, maybe I have seen it. It does look like a painting of Manet, or maybe it's a painting of Moon, or maybe it's a painting of you know somebody else. But, but of course, this painting doesn't exist. So there's a very interesting relationship to memory. And if you look closely, you can find all kinds of innovation in this art. So when people say, oh, you know, you know, machine learning is so limited because you can only recreate what we give it. No, if you look more closely, if you actually know about visual art or musical literature, it's quite innovative because it does generate new styles, new combinations, new remixes, which I haven't seen before. So it's already it's already very advanced. Uh, and we can't expect AI to generate completely new art because then we'll never recognize this art, right? You know, Duchamp brings, you know, right, the urinal, this must produce object to the gallery and says that's not part of art. But that was not part of art before. So if AI generates something which is really innovative, we would we would have no idea. We'll miss it. So that's my answer. Plus, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, our next question will come from our very own Jess Chen. 
And Jess, you should be able to turn on your microphone uh, whenever you'd like. Hi, love. Hi, Mackenzie. Thanks for talking today. Uh, my question is related to something that I just read about. So the one of the columnists at the New York Times recently turned their column into an NFT, and it got sold, I think, today for around half a million dollars. And so while this seemed like mostly a, a statement or even a gimmick, I was just wondering, what do you think um, of NFTs kind of penetrating the the market beyond the art market and what it might mean um, for the cultural arena if if these types of texts or other uh, or other artifacts can be turned into NFTs. Yeah, yeah. well, but um, so actually it was, uh, I think, sold on the same platform, I think, with foundation, at least I saw it like yesterday. Again, right, I feel uh, not so qualified to talk about it because I only started to look at this phenomena closely like a few weeks ago. Uh, and usually, you know, I, uh, you know, maybe, maybe academics, right? Like we say, oh, there's a conference call, I'll write a paper. I never do it, right? I think about something for about three to five years when I write like an article of three days. So it's a bit early. But uh, so it turns out, right, that everything can be like, to everything can be turned into kind of visual art, like the column of New York Times. I don't know, the air, right, on top of your apartment, you know, the chicken you ate for breakfast, um, which is also fascinating. So it's definitely we are like what I would call Duchamp land, right? So everybody can become Duchamp now. So it's like mass production of Duchamp, so everything can be turned into art, and then everything can be sold, right? So you have these equations, you know. Uh, everything, money, and digital art, uh, how it's going to play out, we don't know yet, right? Because it's developing. Uh, perhaps it'll be regulated, perhaps it'll uh, could just blow off, uh, perhaps it will go out of fashion. But as I said, I hope there are some elements of it, which will stay because there are some very progressive elements. Uh, as far as the art market, you know, um, so I was trained as an artist, right? Uh, since the age of 13. And in fact, my painter, I can remember she showed me, I was 13, right? So she, 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 you know, I, I go visit I mean, my teacher and she said, left. That's the best art which ever existed. That should be your ideal. And she shows me works of Giorgio Morandi, which remains one of my favorite painters, right? Because it's all about this amazing reliability and intricacy. And it's like, how do you, what kind of painting you do in the age of Mussolini and kind of mass hysteria when you make this really minimalist, right? But very really still lives. And that's why I think that formalism is the most uh, politically, active strategy, right? So uh, that's how you refuse ideology. But anyway, so when I went, went to New York, right? It's like 80s, you know, East Village, postmodernism. I see these people arriving with big limos, right? Uh, but like, you know, going to these galleries. I said, this is not art, this is something else. Uh, and I said, I don't want to be part of it. So um, I think there's art and there's an art market. So I try not to think about art market because I just don't think it's like, it's like I should spend my brain on it. Um, and I actually don't know why people would take it seriously, right? I mean, why we have to make art for like 3000 people who buy million plus dollar artworks and half of them live in New York, but of course we never live where we just have apartments. So why should we care, right? Okay, we can use art, wine, FATs, whatever we want. Uh, for entertainment, right? We can use it to compete with each other. Look, I got this painting by Basket, and I got this painting by you know by uh, somebody else. Why should we care, right? We should refuse the rich people in the art market to define what art is. And uh, this is kind of my provocative, right? Scream to people in New York, especially in Brooklyn. Just forget about art market. Start ignoring it, and start building something else. Uh, probably not FNTs. Um, so that's kind of my response. Why should we care? Yeah, the, the art world is where art goes to die. And if artists make a living out of that, that's fine. But that's 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 a day job. That's work. Yeah, it's not necessarily the art. Uh, there's a way in which the model of the artwork changed from being the exceptional version of the commodity, the one that's produced by unalienated labor. Uh, the artworks now is now a financial instrument. And there's sort of like a perfecting of that model that happening at the moment, but that's that's a tendency that's been there for a while, and it, and it maybe sort of tracks with the uh, 
uh, invention of a derivative economy. Uh, it was bigger than the sort of the real underlying one uh, where you know, most of what's bought and sold at the moment is information. That's that's derivative of other processes underlying it. Which is sort of sort of you, we, we see versions of this percolate through the art world as well. We don't have a good handle either, particularly culturally, on what it means to live in an information economy. I think we're sort of using, and here I agree with Lev, we're using concepts that are really from another era that don't really apply to it. Like uh, information economics is deeply weird. Uh, and, and, and maybe and also maybe also concepts like art, right? Art meant something else in the 18th century or even in 1990. Yeah. Like we have a thing, but it's something else. It's like this different thing. Anyway, uh, I don't well, know and, where you're going. And we impose yeah, the idea of art on the past. Like art as we know it now didn't exist in the Renaissance. It's something else really completely different. But we retrospectively make that the precursor to what we imagine we're doing now or what we imagine we're doing in, in, in modernism, you know. Uh, so yeah, there's a, there's a few things to unpack there. But my other, my other thought is, I'm just wondering if, like, uh, I, rather than try to sell my papers to a library, maybe I'll just turn them all into NFTs and and <laughs> put them on an exchange somewhere, and that'll be. Well, more that's a, yeah. Well, that's an interesting thing. Can you sell something which is different? But you know, I see this amazing question by Cameron K Case. Can we kind of go over? It? Would you mind? Sure. Okay. We actually have um, a question from Daniel Chavez first, if that's all right. Okay, okay. Sure, sure, sure. sure. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. But I love everything you're talking about. This is very much what we uh, talk about at, at every single one of our lunches at the rail. And Daniel, you should be able to turn on your microphone. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the talk. I wanted to uh, to ask a little bit about maybe on the back of the question about the, the journalists uh, selling their column as, as, as an NFT, uh, about the role of critics uh, and of criticism, uh, not so much about the style and, and cultural production, or rather, and criticism understood as part of cultural production. And what do you think uh, left might be the future of criticism uh, in this new, in its technical dimension, say, refound technical dimension as, as yeah. people? People with computers, such as yourself, no, because uh, you might be one one of those strange examples of people who who had technical backgrounds and then went into criticism and then went back into yeah. technical background and back into yes, criticism yes. again. Sure, sure. Well, thank you so much. I mean, actually, you know, this is like I'm looking at all the questions, both once we're able to answer, once people write. Broken rail, you guys, you guys rule. It's amazing, amazing. The people who join us today, it's just like I feel so like humbled and um, okay just delete, please when you if you're going to record if you're going to publish this video just delete my part because the questions are so amazing anyway so uh, so how do you how do you do cultural criticism and what is cultural criticism in the age of big data nfts uh, instagram and so on so for me you know when i uh, realized that uh, this kind of explosion in quantity of connections communications participation and products in culture around 2005, and why 2005? Because that was a moment in the summer of 2005 when it became possible to add images to blogs, and suddenly we have this visual web exploding. I mean, when Facebook and YouTube existed, but they didn't really become popular until 2007, 2008, in developing countries until 2011. So I was fascinated, I was kind of drunk, right? For me, big data was like a drug, right? Okay, I have to admit it, okay? <laughs> I'm a drug addict. Okay. Um, and people said there's something about, right? So it's like this attraction of, but, and when I was starting to think why I'm so attracted to it. And I thought, you know, maybe what attracts me about big data is I can't look at this, right? So I can only like analyze it or visualize it. So when I render this visualization, like using software I wrote, or 1 million manga pages, I kind of had to wait for two days until I see it. So there is something very sexy and seductive about the fact that if you want to write about 1 billion artworks, like, you know, you can't even like, if you just want to sort them, you have to wait. And then I said, okay, Lev, but you know, this is all wonderful, but how can you kind of bring this analysis, this exploration of uh, art, cinema, design, typography on large scale, can you ever come back to a single image? Can you ever write about a single image? And for a number of years, I was like, I kind of want to, but I can't. And then, you know, eventually, you know, you can get rid of your drug addiction, so to speak. So I had to write this uh, kind of a cultural, okay, sorry, I'm like, yeah, this cultural analytics book, here it is. And there was a moment where I started to look at single images. And in fact, I'm working about, Mackenzie, don't get nervous. 
I'm working about six or seven book projects at the same time, just taking notes. And the way I'm going to do it, I'm just going to finish, my plan is finish one book per year and just publish it online. Because if I deal with, you know, I, because, you know, if, because if I deal with academic process, it will take forever. In one of the books I'm developing, I'm actually writing a book about how to look at single photograph. So there'll be 200 page book where I just analyze a single photograph. And will I be able to say anything different about this photograph? Now that I went for this kind of computer journey, it actually became perfect of computer science, this ultimate art performance. I'm like professor in the fucking computer science, teaching fucking PhD computer science students in the fucking uni graduate center. I'm never taking single computer science class in my life. And you know what? I'm better than them, actually, because it's not so hard to, you know, to be pro computer scientist today. What's hard is to have good ideas. Well, I wouldn't be able to do that at MIT. So in my case, I'm able to come back, right, at the other end and uh, to look at a single image. Um, but um, uh, I mean, how, how do you can write, how do you make it into a method? I mean, I think one way, easy way to say it, like if we place one image in the context of millions of images, it allows us to see more precisely how unique or how typical it is. Uh, we may find that what's unique about this particular image or video or dance performance is just this very tiny part, which never even noticed. Uh, so um, I think it's very, so in my case, you know, in my case, I feel very optimistic, right? In my case, I feel I'm now at a point where I can write about millions of images and one, and I do attempt to become perhaps the first art critic of uh, realistic AI generative art. And also will write article about NFTs. But in my case, it took me 15 years to get this point. Um, so um, it's a very interesting question, right? How do you combine big data and uh, single objects? Thank you so much for that answer. Um, and now finally, we'll go to Cameron Keyes' question of futures. Um, and Cameron, you should be able to turn on your microphone now. Uh, great. So yeah, it sounds like Lev may have uh, read the question already and probably has something in his head about what he wants to say. So maybe I'll actually just... he hasn't read it. So if you if you would like to read it in your own words, I think that um, would be great. Well, it's basically you had mentioned previously about um, trying to make quantitative predictions of 20 or 30 years in the future. And when 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 theorists try to do such things with, for example, you know, other kinds of technology, usually the further out in the future you go, the more susceptible those predictions are to, you know, constraints and assumptions. And one way of getting around that is to do scenarios based um, futures right. predictions. And so I, I was just curious how you thought about um, researching that question and making such predictions. Or would you use a, a scenario based approach or, and how would you present that kind of a thing to audiences? Yeah, so thank you so much for this uh, question. So um, I'll just share my screen for a second, um, just to show you the poster I made in Photoshop last fall. For the first class, I was teaching about this issue, you know, how can we predict culture and art in 2050? And you'll see like it's the same, it's the same kind of gradient background. So it's my kind of visual branding for this idea. <laughs> uh, so here it is. Okay, so this, yeah, so this is, I just pasted also URL. So this is a Milan note board. I'm using Milan note now for my classes. Uh, and the class is called how to predict culture in 2050s, where description, where topics, there was uh, lectures. And, uh, and uh, so very briefly, right? Uh, so of course, future studies and future prediction is a very big topic. And there's lots of approaches. Like when I started looking at this, I came across a recent book which, which is called 23 methods in future studies, right? So there's the prediction markets, there's scenarios. And I think this is all very interesting. So I want to explore it. Uh, and the reason why, right? I mean, do we actually, can we actually predict culture in 2050? We can predict a few things, but probably not the most important things. But the reason to do it, which again is another impossible goal, is I think it will allow us to look at our cultural present in a new way and also I, can, I want to do it because so much of people's attention today is focused on today, right? It's able like NFTs or <laughs> coronavirus, right? And uh, we live in this kind of presentism and this kind of presentism of Twitter, I think has also become a bit of presentism of contemporary culture. And, you know, it's good to put things in a longer perspective, like thousands of years or at least uh, centuries. So one of the things I'm doing, for example, in this course 
you know, I'm basically uh, presenting a lecture where I look at the uh, kind of modern artists, filmmakers, poets, and we'll have poets very soon as visionaries, right? As people who are predicting the future and also building it, right? I mean, Malevich, Kandinsky, I mean, Mondrian, Miss Van der Rohe, all these people, right? We're kind of futurists. We say the existing culture is no good. It's no longer appropriate for the new age of machines, mass production, you know, airplanes, efficiency engineering, uh, Bolshevism and so on. So we want to predict few culture. And then in a particular place like Soviet Union, uh, where all the old artists immigrated, they didn't want to work with communist government because of course, who wants to work with terrorists, like Lenin and his bunch, but uh, the young artists who had no, there's no art world, right? Nobody was selling Malevich in Chelsea. They said, okay, we said, forget it, we'll do it anyway because that's our only chance, right? So for about five, six years, artists had these amazing resources, you know, and then they can develop these ideas for the future. So maybe it is Malevich or Krutikov designing Flying City, you know, or uh, Fritz Lang, right? Or, uh, you know, all these different people, right? They're basically futurists. Okay, uh, so it's also, I think, my way to trick people into looking at the kind of modernism and avant-garde again, uh, because frankly, I think uh, the ideas we had in the last uh, 20th century, often they're may, way more interesting than the ideas we have now. I mean, think about how few terms we use today to talk about things. Media, software, capitalism, alienation. Yeah, they're good terms, but just not so many, right? Uh, this is both Mackenzie and, and left self-criticism in the Marxist style, right? So for example, you look at somebody like Constant and his new Babylon project, right? From late fifties to mid seventies. And Constant is like, you know, radical. He's a future. He says in the future, the robots or whoever will be doing all the work. Humans will be free. will be kind of roaming from this beautiful superstructural architectural kind of space, these endless corridors, but uh, all we don't know because in purpose, right? He doesn't specify them you know, very, very clearly. And then, uh, you know, we'll be basically engaged in art, but different art where environment will be modified. By. So it's a very sophisticated picture, right? This is way more interesting when all the discussions we can have today about AI and if it is, it's kind of more radical, right? Um, so the future already happened and this is called avant-garde. <laughs> and maybe we have to discover it. And this is my hope for 2050. I think we live in a period where we have amazing technology and there are more people than ever before who can use it. And amazing communication of ideas. But I wish I was born in 1883 or 1940. And, uh, you know, uh, because for me, the period from 1907 to 1932 and from 1956 to 71, I'm very specific, are the most amazing ones. Uh, and finally, what I want to say is that the digital humanities and cultural analytics gives us some tools for future predictions. Because when you analyze, millions of or hundreds of thousands of cultural artifacts created over centuries, you can actually see some quantitative trends when you can extend them. So there's a, I will finish in a second. There's a guy, James Cutting, he's a professor of psychology at Cornell. And he his students were working for about 25 years now on analyzing movies. So let's say he makes a database of about 10,000 feature films, which cover a period from 1900 to today. And he measures the speed of editing. Right? Like what's the average length of a shot in a film? And he finds out that it's like this linear curve, linear trend. So it starts at about 16 frames, 16 seconds per shot in 1900 and gets to about four. So then you can extrapolate it. You can say, okay, maybe by 2050, the films will have an average shot length of like one and a half seconds. But then of course you say, we're going to run across the limits of human perception and cognition, right? So can you actually, do you want to watch a feature film where every shot is one frame? Maybe not, or maybe we'll develop new capacities, right? To do that. Um, so that's why I think this is a kind of interesting idea, right? Uh, so I'm kind of using this idea of predicting future culture as a platform, right? <laughs> to bring together all kinds of stuff, you know, from Malevich and Russian avant-garde to uh, computer science and neuroscience. And uh, we'll probably have a book about it. Some, at some point. Yeah, thanks, yeah, that's, that's the reference, yeah. Uh, of course, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I just browsed through it very briefly. It looks very fascinating. Uh, highly recommend everyone check out uh, this link. Uh, thank you for that uh, very generous answer. And for a final question, uh, we'll be going to our very own publisher, 
and the captain of this fine ship, Fong H. Bui. And Fong, you should be able to turn on your microphone now. Thank you, Malvika. Thank you, Lat. Thank you, Mackenzie. This has been so compelling, inspiring conversation. Um, I just have so much in my mind that I need to digest, maybe not be able to sleep tonight even, you know? <laughs> What you brought up, no seriously. Oh, that's perfect. That's my plan. My plan. My plan. My plan is to. It's me against against Rosa Dawn, yeah. <laughs> yes. Look at. Yes. Can, can, yeah. Can can left can left overwhelm the effects of Rosa Dawn, which is what I'm taking. Anyway. I know. But you know the, 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 You mentioned Malevich. We we forgot that um, when he wrote the manifesto of suprematism um, was. Pretty much the same time when Manoretti did, with also futurism. You know, they have different effects. One with Soviet Union, the other is probably Mussolini fascism because they met right after the first war. Uh, my 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 question, maybe two, one for you and one for Mackenzie. You know, because well, let's do the reverse. Let's go to Mackenzie first, and then go you left if you don't mind. Mackenzie uh, was so brilliant when you pay a tribute to our dear friend mentor, um, Paul Liberio, the friend philosopher. Um, he actually, the rail, it was in October 2018, soon after his passing, you know, Lev. So Mackenzie yes. came with uh, Dr. Spooky, also known mm -hmm. at Paul Miller, David Levi. Yeah. Strauss, one of our uh -huh. editors. I wish he's joining the conversation, maybe the future. Mm -hmm. And Teresa Goodeed, one of our editors at large. So we trade tribute, ended up with beautiful, um, thoughtful conversation between Paul and our other dear friend, mm -hmm. And it was, it was a very important evening for the rail. Uh, I think in the sense that what we try to do here is trying to mediate how to counter speed which, uh -huh. with, with, with something that you have yes. missed. You know, we are futurists. So it, it's a very important speed. thing. Speed, speed, another one. Scale and speed, right? This is, exactly. Okay, right? so this is a two- For future, future isn't the point po we you, right? Yeah, uh, and yeah. you know, you know Manoretti almost died in a, in a car race, remember? He loves speed. No, I don't remember, but yeah, actually, Foucault, Foucault also like fast cars. Yeah, Foucault discovered Ricky in fast cars late 50s. So. Exactly. Yeah. There's a whole, there's a whole like California kind of un uh, unconscious to French theory, but okay, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it later. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, no, sorry, but, sorry. But the point, the point is that Mackenzie is that, um, you know, speed and power is something that Paul had invested his whole entire life in studying, in, you know, meditate. And it's because it's, it, 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 it has incredible endless references to architecture, to city life, to all the arts and to the military. We know that, you know. Yes, and, and cinema. And cinema, of course. My point is, is simply the fact that someone like Trump, who is the master of deployment or mobilization have an incredible power to deploy speed, you know, through his Twitter, you know, and he, I believe that he had the power to come up with words, very simple as three words, you know, Mackenzie, like um, build the wall, hmm. lock her up. You see the image right in front of you. You see it, it's spelled out. It's no more, no less than what Karl Kraus say of Hitler when he rose to power in 1934, 35. He said the secret of the demigod is to make himself as stupid as his audience. So they think they are clever here, you know? So we know all of this similar history that somehow get redeployed throughout the ages, Mackenzie and that. My question is this, where does it fit in? Our defense, our potential investment dedication, commitment to aesthetic, because we care about aesthetic. Aesthetic is, look look at Mackenzie. Look how beautiful Mackenzie looks. <laughs> you know, I love your glasses too. It looks great on you, Lance, you know? 
my, my point is that aesthetic is concerned with beauty, with harmony, things that pleases us like the same way that it pleases children. A child is pleased immediately when he or she or they identify beauty. So the opposite of aesthetic is anesthetic. The temporary loss of sensation, the state of paralysis, amnesia, of all of it. You know, so my point is like, I know somehow when I sat down um, several months after September 11 uh, with Leon Gollop, the painter who I was very close with, I was telling Leon, I was so impressed how Arcata people managed to buy disposable SIM cards, you know that, and put in, insert it into mobile phone and they throw out the end of the day. No one can trace them. We're talking about low technology here. Low technology and aesthetic is my interest at the moment. Haven't sure. heard you exchange back and forth. So what, what are we, how do we mediate? How do we somehow pull it somewhere where slowness can be more effectively used uh, in education too? That's, that's a lot. That's, uh, that's about seven questions, oh. man. So I, I won't, uh, this goes, I, and I fondly remember the, the evening you dedicated to uh, Virilio, which is where you and I properly met too. Uh, so that, that was a special evening to me. Uh, Virilio is able to think about uh, a, a world engulfed by speed from a point of view that at the end of the day is theological. And I can't inhabit that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm from modernism, like modernism is, is where I was born and, and still live and which, which is, you know, about change and about the possibility of development. I'm, I'm much more skeptical about that now, but, but at least of change and I'm trying to keep track of it, of an, of an aesthetic that wants to know what's going on now. I love Lev's idea of honest theory, because I think that's, that's actually, to me, honest theory is trying to live in the present and not trying to impose the concepts of the present, of the past mm. on the present. And that's, that's a huge struggle and almost impossible to do. Uh, but, I, but I do have a kind of commitment to the aesthetic as the thing that's off the way a little bit, the thing that is a moment in a different temporality. It might not necessarily be slower, but it can be, but is a different rhythm, a different pace that enables you to have some distance from the one that's imposed or whatever this sure. sort of civilization is, so that you could at least inhabit a space for not just for you individually, but for you and your people to inhabit a world that has a different tempo and that, that heightens a sense of um, attention and attentiveness that's different to that which serves the interests of accumulating capital or whatever, so that your, your attention can be tuned to different things. Because at the end of the day, I'm also a, a, a sensualist and a hedonist. I, I just want, you know, to, to live each moment like the burning flame, as Walter Pater says at the end of the book on the Renaissance. Like that still seems to me to be the, the, the ideal of life. And, and so to me, I think that's where my interest in the aesthetic is a little different, but it's related uh, and in alliance with the, the one that you're forming there and of which the rail is an expression. Thank you, Mackenzie. Beautiful answer. Hey. Okay, um, so speed. So, you know, um, another method which I've been using my whole life, and of course I wasn't using it consciously, like I only realized it, you know, many years later. If everybody thinks A, or if most people think A, even smartest people I know, automatically going to claim B. Mm. Why? Just, just to see what will happen. <laughs> so, okay, good. No, but that's what you expect, right? Uh, for me. So, uh, so there's this idea, which makes lots of sense, the capitalism, right, um, kind of wants to enforce you know, speed and, uh, you know, modernization about speed and cinema, right, and war and Berlin, it was brilliant, right, he's probably one of the most important theorists of the 20th century. Uh, definitely when I read him in 1990, it kind of changed my life. I realized I could write about cinema and war and technology the way I would write about art. So it all makes perfect sense, but let's, what will happen if we take you know, the opposite position to say speed is good, we need more speed, we don't have enough speed. Uh, perhaps we, can, we have to evolve new human beings. After all, this is the century of biology. 
uh, new human capacities that have to expand our senses, right? The idea from, you know, McLuhan, Benjamin, and so on. You know, our computers are very fast. We are slow, right? <laughs> the computer can look at, you know, billions of artworks, right? The computer can calculate things very quickly. And the computers are slowed down by us because we're so slow, right? The neurons are firing so slowly. So if we created this world, right, where billions of people are connected and where, you know, millions of cultural artifacts have been shared online every day, maybe we have to rise to the occasion and develop new organs, <laughs> become new kind of, right, cyber, cyber critics, um, which will be able to take the speed. Uh, now, having said that, I also like slowness, right? I mean, I like Morandi, right? I like the fact that one person is doing something, operates with like a single uh, framework for like 40 years. I like uh, Harold Coyne, the first AI artist, the person who started right, doing AI art in 73, uh, when he was a professor at the University of California, San Diego, the same place where I got hired by his, by the next person in, in 96. So he's working with one algorithm. He's working one piece of software 40 years. Yeah which makes art in his style, you know, Herod Coyne, right? Very important. But the point is, why not, why not also embrace, right? For the sake of argument, opposite position and to say we are too slow, we're not fast enough. And uh, we simply have to develop new organs. Um, and maybe this is one direction where I like what Mackenzie took my like, idiotic idea of one sphere, did something with it. So maybe, you know, maybe we have to do it. And, and I want to say one thing, the same thing goes about data, right? So everybody says we're overwhelmed data, too much data. No, we don't know anything. We have lots of data about the same few things, right? There is all kinds of data about like rich artists. <laughs> uh, if I ask you, okay, what kind of photographs am I making in Timur and Russia? And how these photographs by let's say young students are different from photographs made in, you know, Des and Korea. First of all, you never heard of the cities. So you don't have this data. And you had secondly, we have no idea. If you walk outside, right, of Brooklyn Rail, let's say, you know, there are these people sitting like in a coffee shop and they're making something with Photoshop and they kind of put on different art. What is, what is where? We have no idea, right? Like what are, the, what are the 20 most frequently used types of compositions or content on Instagram? Nobody yeah. has any idea. Nobody even looks at it, right? So we don't have any iconography of contemporary culture. So we, we know a lot about few things and we have no idea about the rest. And because the rest is getting bigger and bigger, right? More people doing culture, right? I mean, every cafe becomes a cultural space, right? Like in a place like Korea. I mean, every cafe has a better design than MoMA. It's best Asia, right? So there's culture become like everywhere, which means we are much more ignorant than, we, than people like 20 years ago, where we knew a bit about something and now we know a bit about something, but the rest of the world is a million times bigger. So we need more data and we need to have more speed to process it. Uh, and do I believe it? Mostly yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I think that's a beautiful place to move uh, to poetry. How does everyone feel? Um, so at the rail, we have a tradition of ending uh, with poetry, and today I'm so thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the day, of the evening, Stephen Ira, to the stage, proverbial stage. Stephen Ira is a writer, filmmaker, and performer. His poetry has appeared, or shortly will, in venues like Diagram, Poetry, Fence, American Poetry Review, and Tag Verk. As an actor, he's appeared at venues like La Mama, Dixon Place, and The Stud, creating roles in new plays uh, by poets like Max Crandall and Bernadette Meyer. Uh, in 2013, he was a Lambda Literary Fellow, and just uh, recently in 2019, he completed his MFA at the Iowa Writers' Workshop. He's currently a poetry editor at the speculative magazine, very appropriate, uh, Strange Horizons. Give it up for Stephen Ira, and Stephen, take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for, for bringing me here. This is a very exciting conversation to, um, uh, to join. Um, and I'm, I'm, oh no, of course not, there's a siren. I hope you guys didn't hear that. Um, so the, the position um, to which I come to kind of like questions of aesthetics and stuff, especially some of the questions that I feel like we're talking about tonight, um, are that everyone in my immediate family, except for me, is a method actor, um, which is a really frustrating position. <laughs> um, and I'm a poet. Um, so uh, this poem has to do with um, the playwright Anton Chekhov and some kind of like questions about 
uh, modernism and realism that I thought, you know, we're talking about AI um, and about something seeming to be, you know, a human intelligence. Um, yeah. So this poem is called Chekhov and the Lady Death. Death would pass over us for millions of infamous reasons. But one day I stopped giving lessons and death wrote a staggering lie all over my door. You name it, I'm next to it. My last words here and everywhere will be no doctors. All the usual parts in the usual order. That, my boy, is what repertory means. But I limited myself, swamped with the bad faith paperwork of my position, ate ambivalence at the feet of my superiors, all the townspeople flicking that body down the hill. Hope his role was easy. Somebody here remembers the trick, those stones they sucked pain into. I'm a white woman with a grievance on the automated line. Press nothing enough times and someone will talk to you. That's true. If you call enough times, you get death. I can't stand sound anymore or heat or even her, the princess of the gesture, death, who tipped me out of family I had by sitting down exhausted next to me when I sat down exhausted. Once you get that number, if you call enough times, you get death. But I hear the same lady who bought that restaurant wanted to keep it too. At least a little place inside, repulsive slivers stuck out of the lamps. Today there's an ad in my hand that just says, don't believe them. Still, I know someone, someone made it who at a certain point did. I don't need to see the doctor before I say my last words. After Chekhov had demanded realism from everyone he could, he died, leaving his pelvis in my hands, getting my suit all wet, what a long time since I had champagne. Swamped with the bad faith paperwork of my tranny position, I, I am, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> I can account for every word I speak into that glazed crystal. I need a doctor for a new invention. She'll look like a bird or a stone. Don't cry for me. The truth is, I never, I never, I never, Jealousy, turning, sainted, glancingly, turning and turning, my widening pussy. I just can't look. It's a good place to put all the stones we have left. Don't cry, he said, flicking the fringe to my side. Don't cry. You must speak as if approaching tears, never arriving there. A choking actress is a total presence. Don't cry for me, not before I invent this. Nobody wants to die. People want drowned sons a big hit or the queen of the pose, things like that. It's actually natural when things disappear from the stage. Chekhov told me I called that number one too many times, but I wonder if the normal style of love would have worked had it been tried. Chekhov accused me of starting my acting studio to combat overpopulation, but I would never do that. When I was young and pure, I would even refuse to appear in the same shot, but these days I stagger preparedness. Chekhov asked if I've noticed that the Nazis catch me slipping. They keep showing up with flyers for their new escape room. I'm really good at escape rooms. Me, they never charge. Chekhov hand washed the usual parts and the lady death did not complain. She overturned the telephone and she was right. It's underside sported the note from me. So long, Jersey Lily. Look at him, watch that furrow. Remove everything extraneous. Just acknowledge your mark on the floor if you're nervous. Just decide what your action will be. Chekhov watched me sleep, but once I clocked his painted eyes, they came off a little pretentious. I said so, and I flung my sins around once I crawled out of bed. She watches me whatever he does. He watches me whatever he does too. From under her veil, she feeds me suppositories. I don't understand what the characters want in this scene. Death was going to pass over us. Whole families of reason gave way. She wrote that staggering lie over my door. Chekhov watching her do it. Chekhov thinking, why can't she be like this on stage? The river of death came to my truculent door and drowned my son. She took my property. I answered her. When the river of death answered me, I knelt at her boots. I drowned my son, I burned the property, I tore my clothes. 
Show's closed, no doctors. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's incredible. Um, you can't hear us all clapping, but we're clapping. Um, thank you so much, Stephen, for that uh, phenomenal narration. Um, and thank you so much, Lev and Mackenzie, uh, for this wonderful conversation. And of course, thank you to all of you who tuned in today in the audience and in the chat. We're celebrating the Rails 20th anniversary. I love that heart. Uh, we're celebrating the Rails 20th anniversary this year. Uh, it's a year long uh, birthday party, we're celebrating all year. So as a nonprofit, if you enjoyed today's program, please consider making a donation to keep the rail and our special projects free, relevant and independent. Uh, and please join us again tomorrow for a conversation on sculpture and space time, which will be a little bit Star Trek, a little bit Afrofuturism, featuring Mary Mattingly, Yasue Matik, Abigail Deville, and Lisi Raskin, beautifully curated and introduced by my queer elder, Sheila Pepe. And that will be at our usual time at 1 p.m. right here in the Zoom. Other than that, um, you can all turn on your microphones now. I'll send you a little invitation and uh, say goodbye as you leave. But this was so beautiful. Um, thanks. Thank you, love. Thank you, thank you Mackenzie. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you so love. Thank you, Mackenzie. That was amazing, thank Stephen. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, people are like still trying to get in the Zoom. <laughs> OK. Can we just all stay now? Like, I've never seen so many people in New York smiling. So this is like a new New York 2.0. <laughs> uh, so, so as long as me, Mackenzie, I guess, made you guys smile, you know, I don't, I can be Marxist. I don't care, right? You know, theory has to make us laugh. Theory has to give us pleasure. And as long, right, as long as it works, art theory, you know, when it's justified, you know? So I've never seen so many smiling faces in New York. So, okay, I'm looking forward to being back and seeing what's really happened there. Something happened to you guys. <laughs> any, any it was so wholesome, yeah. love. But... You, you, you kind of, like, you kind of, like, yeah, you kind of, like, uh, you're going to make me cry. Place. Maybe oh. people got scared last year and now like everybody realized life is not so bad. And you know, we have to, yeah, absolutely. You know, we have to, you know, we have each other, you know, we have each other, you know, we have these communities absolutely. and um, love everybody. Yeah. And uh, in five days is my birthday. So thank you so much. It's the best birthday party I ever had in my life. Hey. Happy early birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Yes. Thank you, you guys. Thank you, love. Thanks, Stephen.